One day, many months ago, I was randomly browsing Google Images. I punched in Georgia Sorrell into the search engine. After scrolling a bit, I encountered this essay by the National Anarchist Tribe Alliance. The term national anarchism had sparked a revolution in my mind, with this essay being what got me curious about the philosophy and movement. I began researching further into national anarchism, and shortly I became a national anarchist. We have to understand, a lot of great stuff is criminally underrated, all across the internet. The reverse is likewise just as true. This is one piece of content in intellectual property which deserves its own reading. The person who wrote the essay didn't provide the real name. They go by the username anarcho-nationalist0083 and have written 157 articles for the site. So clearly a devout anarchist, this is an extremely well-written literary work by the way. The basis of the text, especially in relation to the enduring relevance part, is that the libertarian Marxist theorist, Georges Eugene Sorel, existed as an historical monument of his time, impreding, in his criticism, elements of the left which became far more prevalent in their emphasis and focus later on in history. Since Georges Sorel was a socialist, his place in history was already past the point of modernity's birth. The French Revolution had spiritually altered the French landscape forever, and the rest of Europe. During this time, the West was cut between the liberal revolution and the traditionalist counter-revolution, with the ideological forces of democratic, feudal, and nationalist society wrote angry letters to one another, decrying the current situation for failing to meet their idealized standards. Sorel occupied a certain position within the left of his age, where it appears he was the first to call out certain behaviors within leftists which were contrary to true proletarian politics. I've spoken about the decline of the right before. The false right came to replace the true right, and with it, nothing was ever the same again. Here, we'll be focusing on the decline of the left. How, with modernity, those on the spectrum of ideology have, too, weakened over the years. On how they've gone from classic gold to genuine AIDS in such a small portion of time. And now for the essay. Georges Sorel is one of the founding fathers of revolutionary cynicalism. His seminal work, Reflections on Violence, is as relevant today as it was when published in 1908. It addresses the hijacking of the working class struggle by the parliamentary left, the failure of democracy to bring about better conditions for the working class, the insufficiency of economics, and the importance of myth to the revolutionary cause. Swell was one of the first to redefine class struggle outside the confines of Marxist economicism, paving the way for non-Marxist forms of socialism, from national syndicalism to anarcho-syndicalism. The fight between phalangists and the CNT during the Spanish Civil War was a conflict between two different interpretations of Sorel. Yet, his influence extends until the present day. The problems Sorel addressed are still very relevant. Where Sorel had his parliamentary socialists, we have our limousine liberals, those leftists who claim to represent the interests of the working man while openly colluding with the forces of high finance. Even the petty social concerns of the modern left were not entirely alien to Sorel's time. As he notes, the Parisian reformer, Henry Thoreau, was advocating not for the working class, but the proletariat of love, referring to the lowest class of prostitutes. In the face of such insanity and avarice, the fate of the common man rests in his own hands. His liberation will only be achieved by violently breaking with the institutions of the upper classes, uncompromisingly, responding by blows to the advances of the propagators of social peace, coming from the ruling elite to distinguishingly extend an olive branch. This revolt would not be inspired by the cold calculations of the economists or the hazy utopias of social planners. But a myth is what led the early Christians to martyrdom, or the ancient Greek to battlefield glory. 
The radical conclusions of Sorel were drawn from a distinct pessimism, in direct contrast to the spirit of the age. The Industrial Revolution had created a bloom of optimism that technological progress would render everyone happy in the near future, quite similar to how the techno-utopians of our own day and age promised us a grand singularity where artificial intelligence will take care of everything and humanity will lead lives of leisure. This optimism flowed into the reformist spirit of the parliamentary socialists, who believed that progressive legislation would eventually cure the social ills of France. In the face of this overwhelming confidence, Sorel casts a cold eye, as these exuberant legislators never came from the working class. They were spoiled by their wealth, decadent and degenerate, prone to spouting humanitarian plebitudes. These socialists were beholden to newspaper intellectuals and Dreyfusad financers, referring to the Dreyfus Affair, that rallied upper-class liberals against anti-Semitism. These socialists no longer wished to overthrow capitalism, but to temper it, correct its abuses, all the while keeping the power in their own hands. In contrast to the optimistic sterility of the upper classes, the working class was thrown by the Industrial Revolution into revolutionary circumstances. The increasing deprivation they suffer breeds fervor. They start to dream of violence, and the soothing words of the politicians can no longer quell them. Indeed, those who claimed to speak for them deserved a good beating, as Sorel states. I believe also that it may be useful to trash the orators of democracy and the representatives of the government, for in this way you ensure that none shall retain any illusions above the character of acts of violence. But these acts can have historical value only if they are the clear and brutal expression of the class war. The middle classes must not be allowed to imagine that, aided by cleverness, social science, or high-flown sentiments, they might find a better welcome at the hands of the proletariat. The political classes must learn to mind their own business, as they must be told, true violent action, but they do not represent the people. In Sorel's time, this would have suppressed the parliamentary socialists and thus granting the working class self-ownership. In our own time, those who seek economic autonomy are once again manipulated by the same political forces. One can look at how the Occupy Wall Street movement, originally an expression of popular outrage, was hijacked by the collegiate individuals who injected their abstruse theories of privilege into the discourse, drowning the concerns of the 99% under the sexual and racial politics of the academic bourgeoisie, a class that lives on the debt slavery of thousands of students, who power is guaranteed and defended by the arms of the American government. These orators of democracy deserved quite the trashing for their pretenses of speaking for the working man. They should have been sent packing to the nearest faculty lounge to console themselves with six-figured, tenured positions. The fact that they were given such an allowance to speak for a class they never shared the slightest affinity with, moreover on the dime of that infamous Dreyfusard financer of our own time, George Soros, is more than ample proof of the necessity of Sorel's thought today. The form of this necessary thrashing of these orienters of democracy is addressed by Sorel in Reflections on Violence in the form of the General Strike. Sorel states, The revolution appears as a revolt, pure and simple, and no place is reserved for sociologists, for fashionable people who are in favor of social reforms, and for the intellectuals who have embraced the profession of thinking for the proletariat. This strike must not compromise or settle for reforms. It is to be taken as the dawning of a new era, the general strike must be taken as a whole and undivided, and the passage from capitalism to socialism conceived as a catastrophe, the development of which baffles description. It cannot be rationalized or defined by science, it is pure faith and willpower. In the cynicalist general strike, the people organize on a bellicose basis. The proletariat organizes itself for battle separating itself distinctly from the other parts of the nation, and regarding itself as the great motive power of history, all other social considerations being subordinated to that of combat. 
it is very clearly conscious of the glory which will be attached in its historical role and of the heroism of its militant attitude. It longs for the final contest in which it will give proof of the whole measure, valor, pursuing no conquest. It has no need to make plans for utilizing its victories. It counts on expelling the capitalists from the productive domain and on taking their place in the workshop created by capitalism. The goal of the cynical strike is to seize the means of production and keep them in the hands of the workers. It is not to get better wages, more welfare, or shorter hours. It cannot be a tool of the politicians, who point to the strikers to justify the need for their pet programs, as if to say, if only you had passed my bill, this could be avoided. It is not an opportunity for young careerists to foist their vision of the future upon the people, as Sorrell warned. There are plenty of young, Barristers, briefless and likely to remain so, who have filled enormous notebooks with their detailed projects for the social organization of the future. Let us beware what Sorel called the socialist financers, who take the side of the worker on occasion to maintain their gains, who wish to use the workers' revolt to strengthen their own position and that of the political cronies. In our own day and age, we occasionally see men of very great wealth and power, like the aforementioned Soros, speak of the need for extended social safety nets and more equal distribution of wealth. They do not do this out of sympathy or any revolutionary instinct. They are doing it to prevent their utter and total destruction. Sorrell remarks that this class will be swept away. The general strike of the cynicalists drives away from socialism all finances in quest of adventures. The revolution has no need for such men. The revolution will be absolute and irrevocable because it will place the forces of production in the hands of free men, i.e. of men who will be capable of running the workshop created by capitalism without any need of masters. This conception will not at all suit the finances and the politicians whom they support, for both are only fit to exercise the noble profession of masters. Those who come offering to lead the working man to utopia of their own creation should be met with fists. The syndicalist strike is not asking for new masters. It will not result in the formation of a new democracy, with new parliaments for the next generation of careerist politicians to grandstand in. The syndicalist is not asking to replace a benevolent hierarchy by a benevolent one. It is not an attempt to hijack the government to bother the rich for the benefit of the poor. Throughout history, we have seen states pass harsh laws against the rich, only to benefit the state. The revolution will not be a cabal of mercenaries blackmailing the wealthy for their own enrichment. That has been the nature of demagogic politicians since time immemorable. The cynicalist jangle strike brings to the fore the pride of free men and thus protects the worker from the quackery of ambitious leaders. The resulting society from the cynicalist is open-ended, anarchic, mutable. Sorrell states that instead of seeking to emulate the old middle-class institutions embodied in parliamentary democracy, it would be better for it to remain content for a time with weak and chaotic organizations rather than that it should fall beneath the sway of syndicates which would copy the political forms of the middle class. In the wider social context, the organization can vary widely across regional, cultural, religious, and ethnic forms. To attempt to reconstitute the unitary state would be a betrayal. Instead, the power should remain directly in the hands of the workers on the lowest levels, making their own decisions. Sorrell states, the free producer in a progressive and inventive workshop must never evaluate his own efforts by any external standing. If by some grand strike the power were to be seized across the United States by the people, there would be a multiplicity of visions. In the South, the workers may rise the rebel flag, while in Harlem, pan-African colors will fly over the people's new conquests. Putting power in the hands of the people means that they will be free to pursue their own visions, not a singular one imposed by the will of the state. The driving fire for this great uprising of the masses is a myth. It burns in the soul of all free men. It inspires him to risk sacrifice, even to the point of surrendering his own life, to attain the vision of glory he holds in his heart. The scientific prejudices that suggest it is unrealistic, it is not the right time, it is dangerous, hold no sway over the revolutionary. 
Revolution is not a creation of what Sorel derisively called the little science. Rationalism of the Enlightenment era is very much a part of the liberal capitalist worldview. For the Enlightenment liberal, scientific progress will solve all problems. The clockwork mechanism of the market will spur the growth of new tools to ameliorate the deficiencies of the current social system. Among the class of parliamentary socialists and their modern equivalents, this so-called scientific thinking inevitably results in the construction of utopias, whereby the implementation of their program, all the ills of the world will be cured. They think if only we tweaked some wages or interest rate, that everything would just be perfect. The revolutionary does not think like that. His forebears are not economists, but warriors and martyrs. The general strike must be taken as a myth for the proletarian warrior to march into battle with. He is like the early Christians who willingly adopted martyrdom. The revolutionary syndicalist is more a Homeric figure living out a great drama, a quest to glory, rather than a mere automation performing the calculated actions of some economist. He must not expect any material reward. No hero in war has ever expected such a recompense. Only the glory of victory shall satisfy him. The general strike is a new moral paradigm that inspires the same ada as moralities that man in the past died for you. Revolution conceived as a salvation. In the mystic conception of revolution, Sorel did something very important. It represents a new turning point in the history of Western thought. It is a revolutionary form of the counter-enlightenment. It does not look to resurrect the moralities displaced by the Enlightenment. However, it is in distinct conflict with the prevailing scientific and rationalist viewpoint of the Enlightenment. Sorel overthrows the liberal worldview as the liberal worldview overthrows the feudal world. In breaking from an economic view of revolution, he has superseded Marx, who subscribed to the clockwork universe offered by the capitalists of the Enlightenment. This makes Sorel the founding father of all modern, non-Marxist forms of socialism. For the American today, much has been made of socialism, generally in a negative sense. It is either the iron totalitarianism of the USSR, or the tepid welfare state liberalism of Sweden. The idea of socialism as a means of people power is never heard in the United States. With Sorel, we see a thoroughly anti-liberal, populist socialism the socialism of workers' self-ownership. In the past, we saw some flares of this in American history. The IWW is the prime example of this current in the United States. The radical American labor activism of the early 20th century sought to seize mines and oil fields from the hold of their corporate masters. However, as the century progressed, the labor movement fell into the hands of the American equivalent of Sorel's parliamentary socialists, the politicians and bankers who sought to stave off the rage of the working men by throwing them crumbs from the congressional table. Today, we must recover that heritage. Sorrell offers us a way to take control of our lives. Neither corporations nor states will free us. Only the direct action of the people themselves will lead to the great American revolution that will liberate us from both. Having occupied political space in the Third French Republic as a controversial figure amongst Sorel's fellow leftists for his advocacy and romanticization of revolutionary violence, his position was noticed by the Integral Nationalists, led by Charles Maurice, with his followers courting him, getting him to join Action France's. Sorel complied, wishing to merge the best parts of the classical left with the classical right, a nationalist variant of syndicalism. However, he later abandoned Marxism and socialism altogether when he became more immersed with the politics of the European royalists. Even later, he had reverted back to his old days, abandoning nationalism in favor of a strict orthodox cynicalism, admiring the Russian Bolsheviks under the leadership of Vladimir Lenin. The way I feel about Georges Sorel is sort of the way I feel about, say, Max Stirner, both libertarian socialists. My takeaway from both of them is that their focus on such narrow topics, only a few subjects discussed in their work, with them being known for very specific things, very few even reading the literary works, prevents them from appealing to me more. Their approach to politics differs greatly from how most political philosophers approach issues, the pressing matters of their time, because of the metapolitical narratives they've spun. Stern has spoke of everything in egoistic terms, because his entire worldview, everything he discussed, had to resolve around egoism, 
had to go back to the ideology he's invented. Sorrell likewise, with his anti-materialism, permitted such political ontology to bleed into every aspect of his works, including his reasons for abandoning Marxism and the left. Yet simultaneously, I still very much like the both of them. At the end of the day, the ideological positions they held were correct, representing new dimensions of political thought during their time. For the subjects they provide focus to, they managed to give new interesting perspectives, different views, on things we're already familiar with. Sorel will continue to be relevant, just as long as contemporary leftism's faults and mockability, too, remains relevant.